Hello. Welcome to IoT and 5G Future Evolution, the role of RF technologies with Nuno Carvalho. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by the MTTS Education Committee. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archive webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current web page if you encounter any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your system's master volume. <clears throat> the icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Nuno Carvalho was born in Luanda, Angola in 1972. He received the diploma and doctoral degrees in electronics and telecommunications telecommu engineering from the University of Aro in Aviro, Portugal in 1995 and 2000. He is currently a full professor and senior research scientist with the Institute of Telecommunications at the University of Aviro. He is also an IEEE fellow. He has co-authored multiple books, including Intermodulation in Microwave and Wireless Circuits, Microwave and Wireless Measurement Techniques, and White Space Communication Technologies. He has been a reviewer and author of over 200 papers in magazines and conferences. He is associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Microwave Theory and Techniques, IEEE Microwave Magazine, and Cambridge Wireless Power Transfer Journal. Dr. Carvalho is the co-chair of the IEEE MTT20 Technical Committee and has been, been involved with multiple other TCs as well as with other MTTS entities. He has received numerous awards. His main research interests include software-defined radio front ends, wireless power transmission, nonlinear distortion analysis, and microwave and wireless circuits systems, and measurement of nonlinear phenomena. He has recently been involved in the design of dedicated radios and systems for newly emerging wireless technologies. Now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Nuno Carvalho for IoT and 5G Future Evolution, the role of RF Technologies. Nuno? Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation and uh, for uh, your long description of my uh, CV. Uh, and uh, welcome to this talk that uh, hopefully will be interesting for everybody today. So um, the talk that I will give is actually uh, on the IoT and 5G feature evolution. And my main focus today will be how the RF technology can actually improve what uh, it is, from my point of view, the biggest problem for this IoT 5G uh, issue, which is the problem of the energy that I need to communicate and to use uh, in these feature systems, and how can I minimize the amount of energy that I'm using in these uh, components? So, uh, in, in order for you to see the first motivation slide, actually, what I want to show in this slide is uh, you can see that uh, all the time, even in the past, when we need to communicate, we need to use energy. The energy is all over the place. If you see the first uh, image uh, where we use smoke signs, smoke signs actually need to use energy to communicate. If we use pigeons for communication, we need to use energy for feeding the pigeons. Or if you go sailing around the world to make a commercial transaction, there's always energy involved in this scenario. And if you look to the top of my slide, you can see that we start with fire, then we go for uh, pigeons, let's say communication area, then we start to use electronic communication. And the first uh, electronic communication, let's say from a data point of view, and I'm not talking about the phone, I'm talking already uh, uh, about data, 
we were connected to an outlet in the wall. So we used energy from the wall and we actually used that energy to transmit and to connect our personal computers. The next step, and the next step is mainly the, the, the biggest step for the wireless area, we actually start to communicate using wireless signals. And when we start to communicate wireless signals, the difference on the energy was that we were not connected to a power, but we try to be, let's say, portable. So we use our wireless laptop, and we start to use laptops all over the, the place using Wi-Fi and wireless uh, local area networks. And in that case, the energy that we need for communicate with wireless parts was using batteries, and we strongly um, based our actually our energy need on the battery approach. We can see that with our mobile phones, for, the, for instance, today. But what do we see on the uh, top uh, right of my figure or of my slide is actually what is going to happen now with the IoT or with the 5G is that instead of using one wireless device, I will start to use 10 or more wireless devices around me. I will start to use a multitude of wireless devices and all these wireless, all these RF gadgets, let's say, will need a lot of energy to communicate. And how can we actually cope with this energy footprint? And how can we design RF circuits that actually can cope with all these needs? And that's why uh, I, in the next slide, I normally present what is called the IoT or IOE. IoT means Internet of Things, IOE means Internet of Everything, because actually the objective with the Internet of Things is to put all things connected together. So all things will be connected, and I, I think they will be wireless. So that's why I call it wireless things. And if you look to the slide that I have there, the images that I have there, I separate this concept in two parts. One part is what I call the low bitrate part. What that means, well, it means that it will be all the things that will be connected, but they are very low power, they need very high, low complexity, sorry, and they are very low bit rate. Some of the examples include the remote controls for changing the channels in my home, or uh, includes a, a car to use the underground or the, the train station and so on. So actually, this is something that we really need to use, and it should be low power, low cost, very simple things. On the other side of the Internet of Everything, we'll, have, we'll continue to have our laptop that will be connected to the Internet. I love to see high-definition video. I love to see 3D videos. I will be everywhere making huge amount of data communication. And this part is what I call the high bit rate. So they will be high power, they will be high complexity, and they will be more and more high bit rate. And this is actually what I try to represent with the two images that I have in the middle, which is a washing machine on one side and a piece of cloth on the other side. What I want to represent with this is that if my washing machine wants to connect to the internet, for instance, to know what is the best program it should use for the washing machine, it can connect to the internet without any problem. And the amount of energy is not an issue here for the communication scenario because the washing machine is connected to a power outlet and it is spending a lot of energy to operate. But if you look on the other side, I have a piece of cloth. And if you want to throw the cloth inside my washing machine, and tell the washing machine, select the best program to wash my clothes, the washing machine should top with the clothes. And the clothes should have some kind of tag, some kind of sensor. And here is one problem, that is, how can I got and how can I bring the Internet of Things to my clothes if I have to use a battery? Why? Because I don't want to recharge the batteries of all my clothes every day. And so this is actually what is creating this big problem at this stage, and uh, this image that I, I'm showing you now comes from the European uh, Union and actually shows what is going to be the big challenge from 4G to 5G. 4G, you have mainly a laptop, you have mainly a tablet connected to the Internet, high bitrate or, let's say, 
uh, medium bit rate, that will be good. You have access to your email, access to your, most of your uh, Facebook accounts and so on. But the 5G is bringing all these things together. So the 5G is actually, you want to include in the internet the smart grid, the connected homes, the connected sports, connect health, the connected cars. So everything is going to be tech. And everything is going to communicate using a wireless signal. And actually, this will bring us to what I normally call the bright smart future, where we will have smart cities, where we will have smart cars, where we huge amount of wireless data, smart health, smart houses, electrical cars going around. And the problem with this smart environment, I'd say, that we are looking at the moment is that this will need a lot of energy. This will need a huge amount of energy to operate. There will be a lot of battery waste. There will be a huge amount of disposals to remove the batteries after they are not allowed to work with us. So this is actually the biggest problem I have at this moment. And in order to better uh, stress and better understand this issue, I have this slide. This slide is quite nice. I, I took these images and these graphs from some uh, important uh, institutes that actually address this problem over the world. And if you look to these numbers, what you have on the right side of the graph, so what you have on the part that you have the, the graph there is mainly the amount of energy we really need to operate a mobile communication base station cellular network. So the amount of energy we have there, the, the first graph means the energy that comes from the power plant. And what you have there, I don't know if you can see it well, uh, the, what you have there is 140 terawatt hour to operate a mobile operator in one specific country. So what you have after is that 10% of that energy is spent on the distribution network. So the amount of energy that you need to bring the energy from the, the, base, the power plant to your base stations, you spend 10% of energy with this distribution. Then you spend 30% more energy with heating, cooling, uh, UPS. So with all things that are not related with the communication itself, then you spend another 20% with uh, the fans on your power outlet. So it's incredible. You spend 20% of energy there. And at the end, you spend almost 70% of the energy in the redundancy. What that means, it means that the base station is there, but nobody is using it, but you need to power it up. So at the end, only, let's say, 20 or 25 terawatt hours, so a very small amount of the energy that was produced in the power plant is actually used to transmit bits. So it's actually used to transmit your signal. But if you look to the left part of the image, you see, a, a, a pie. And what you see in that pie is that 40% of the base station consumption, of the RF base station consumption, 40% goes to the power amplifier. And 30% goes to the air conditioning to maintain the temperature inside the base station. So it's a ridiculous amount of energy that we are actually spending in order that we can operate a huge or a high bitrate base station of cellular network. But if you look from the other side, let's look to the IoT concept. Let's look at the low bit rate concept. What you see here, you see that the amount of batteries that we are going to need for IoT devices is growing very fast, extremely fast. But you see on the other side, on the other two graphs, the red graphs that I have there, the first graph is the standby energy of all these devices. The standby energy is huge amount of energy, and we actually need to use it because the sensors are there, are, are placed on, all, all over the place. But if you look to the bottom of my slide, you see battery manufacturing. What that means, it means that in average for each battery, imagine that the battery has a certain amount of energy saved inside, so for each amount of energy, we need almost four times that energy to create the battery itself. 
So the amount of energy that you, we will need if we continue to use this type of batteries is huge in order to operate these IoT devices somehow. Only very fast, we made in Portugal a very simple uh, analysis. And what we saw, we saw that for a remote control, something that everybody uses to change your channels at home, if we use a remote control to change your channels on your TV and we go to the sensors of Portuguese um, typical houses and you see that uh, we assume that 75% of the houses have a TV equipment, 40% have a cable TV box, 30% have a sound system and we are being conservative here because most of the houses have more than one TV at home. So if we make these simple calculations and, and if you look to the map that is on the, on the, on, on the left, what you see is that Portugal is only that red small dot there. So Europe is huge compared with my country, which is very small. But only for that small country, we are spending 23 million batteries only for a remote control for changing the channels on the TV. So this should actually make us think on can RF microwave technologies minimize this problem? Can we come up with ideas to remove the batteries? to remove the need for hair conditioning, for instance, can we actually remove the need of this huge amount of uh, energy space? And actually, this is what I'm going to talk today. So on one side of this slide, you can see what is my problem for the infrastructure? What can we do from a RF wireless point of view to remove or to minimize the energy? Well, one is cloud radio access network. I will talk briefly about that. The other is, of course, fully smart radio. What that means, it means that my radio should be intelligent enough to select the best frequency, the best power, the best energy pattern to communicate. And, of course, at the end, the white spaces. It is ridiculous, let me say, and sorry for the word, but it is ridiculous if you have to make a phone call with your mobile phone to your colleague that is 100 meters away, your phone should connect to a base station that is probably two or three kilometers away. It should go to some kind of mobile switching center that probably is on another city and return back to communicate again with your colleague. But if you can use a different frequency, if your radio is smart enough, probably you can make a direct connection and that will be lower cost. On the other side, you have the Internet of Everything. So we should go for low power sensors. We could try to use wireless power transmission, and I will show you backscatter communication, I think will be the best for IoT in the next scenario. So the talk, the technical part of the talk, will be mainly divided in two parts, cloud radio access network, access point design, and the sensor design based on backscatter and wireless power transmission combined for IoT sensor uh, schemes. So let's start with the cloud radio access network. Well, what is Cloud Radio Access Network? I took this slide, actually this is a very nice slide that comes from um, some of the mobile operator uh, colleagues. And what you saw in the past was mainly that you have your base station. Uh, this is what is on my left part of my uh, slide. You have your base station. And near your base station, you have all your digital components that actually modulate, demodulate, encrypt, and so on and so on your system. Uh, what we did, the first step that we did in order to devise or separate the base station, let's say, the RF part, the analog part from the digital part, was actually to move the low noise amplifiers, power amplifiers close to the antennas. This will improve your sensitivity and put the digital part down in a cabinet. And the connection was mainly done using a coaxial cable or uh, optical fiber. Well, what is the next step? The next step is actually to be able to remove the digital part from that cabinet that is close to each antenna and move it to a central station. So have a central station and have different coaxial or optical cables, if you want, to connect each of the antennas to that uh, central uh, digital part. And this, of course, what is the optimum scenario here? The optimum scenario here is that if the digital part is done in a, a very interesting way, let's say it's done in a, in a way that it can optimize resources, then you can start to play with white spaces. Then you can start to play with the links that you can have for each of the antennas. 
So the cloud run, what it says is that why not, in order to have this digital central based uh, scenario, why not send this digital part to the cloud and actually operate your signal or whatever you want? So the base station, instead of having all these digital parts, all these idle resources and so on, probably I can maximize my base station, I can reduce the power of my base station, and my base station can be as dummy as the power amplifier, low noise amplifier, and an antenna. So the the let's say I will call it the dummy base station because the base station will will not make any processing in the base station itself. It will receive the signal, transmit the signal using a digital waveform, and all the decisions of your design will be done in the cloud somewhere uh, in the scenario. Of course, you have to be careful about the the, the latency if you want to implement a, a, a cellular network. So, if we look to only this change that is try to remove the digital part, try to remove all these scenarios and make a distribution, a distributed base station scenario, if from these slides that come from China Mobile, which are very interesting, you can see that we immediately can save 38% of the energy that we were spending before. If we can send this to the cloud, that is, if we can optimize the powers, optimize the modulation format, optimize the standards that we are using, we can go for, uh, and I'm looking to this slide, 60% of reduction. This was some of the designs made. But what you, we are saying here is, uh, and you can make your mind saying that what it will be the best option will be to have like Wi-Fi access points that are dummy access points. What that means, it means that they are not really Wi-Fi. They can be LTE, they can be 5G, they can be 3G, they can be whatever it is decided on the cloud somehow. And what I need to do some kind, or what I really need to build a radio like this? Well, I need a very high bandwidth radio. I need the radio to be agile in frequency. I need that it has variable output power. It should handle signals with high peak wave power ratio, it should be low latency, and it should be reconfigurable as much. So these radios should be what is called a software defined radio, where you can see in the slide that you have an analog part that is mainly the amplifiers and mixers, subconverters, non converters, and then you have an ADC and a DAC. And everything is done in the digital part. And since it is done in the digital part, if you meet the latency marks, it can be done whatever you want. Well, and ideally, what I would love to have are all digital radios. What that means, it means that my output is mainly the output on FPGA, for instance, I connected the filter, a power amplifier, and the antenna, nothing more. So the only energy need that I have is on the FPGA, of course, and on the power amplifier. But you can do also on the receiver the same approach. This will be neat. It will be very interesting. The problem is that uh, at this moment, it these are uh, still have limited dynamic range, limited frequency of operation, and I believe it will be resolved soon, but it's not resolved yet. So uh, we can go, as I said, for software defined radio receivers. You can go for baseband conversion, direct conversion, direct sampling conversion on band or band part sampling receivers. Uh, and actually, the configuration of this scenarios is that most of the scenarios you have an antenna, you have a loner amplifier, you have a sampler, and ideally I should sample at RF so that I can have a flexible variable uh, uh, bandwidth as much higher I, I can. And for the transmitter, the same. You can have a super heterodyne transmitter, a direct conversion transmitter, or ideally what would be nice was to have a RF stack followed by a power amplifier and somehow try to use the sampler as a mixer if you want so that instead of using what is called the first Nyquist tone, I will use higher Nyquist tone to transmit my signals. And instead, as you can see in this slide, instead of, for instance, modulating my DAC with a no return to zero, I can use a different pulse for my clock and so I can move the energy back to higher frequencies and transmit in higher frequencies in a very efficient way. Why? let's say the direct sampling transmitter or the bandpass sampling conversion 
is ideal for my uh, software definer read in this scenario? Well, because I can select the frequency, I can select the bandwidth, I can select the power. So the agility of my receiver and transmitter becomes very, very uh, interesting from this point of view. And in this uh, slide, what I want to show is that actually on the receiver part, we are receiving bands on different cyclic zones. On the transmitting part, we are picking up our signal and put it and separate it on different cyclic zones up to the end. The issue here is how an RF engineer can design such a radio. Because RF engineers are used to scattering parameters, are used to filters, amplifiers, mixers, local oscillators. So RF engineers are normally not toggled to digital domain. And this is what I want to show you with this slide. From one side you have let's say, uh, what we are used to see, our spectrum, our constellation diagram, our time domain, I and Q waveforms, these are analog signals. But from the other side, what we are going to receive now are digital bits. It's mainly a world of bits. So uh, if I look to the digital bits, I cannot understand if my circuit is matched, if it's circuit is not matched, if I have enough power, if I need more power. And what I would love to have is actually to have a representation, a digital representation of that signal so that I can design this circuit in a better and improved way. And if we look, we can say, okay, but the ADC and that from the RF perspective, they are not very important. And I say, okay, they are extremely important in these software defined radio designs. Why? Because if you look over frequency, you see that your DAC power, so the power that your DAC receives vary with frequency, so it has a certain bandwidth. If you look to the ADC, the same happens. If we go deeper and you look to the nonlinear distortion, as you can see in the middle of my slide, you, what you see is that the intermodulation starts to get all over on top of each other. So this is actually a very big problem, and we have to face this problem when we are designing software defined radios. So the RF engineer should not look anymore only to the amplifiers, mixers, oscillators, filters. They start to have and to look to the digital to analog converter and the analog to digital converter in a way that actually it becomes a piece of his design. So what I say here is that actually the problem is on the characterization. If I want to use a DAC and ABC in my microwave simulation, I have a problem because it's not a very easy, simple, or it's not a very simple design uh, from that perspective. That's why I, I say that there is a need for a mixed signal characterization. And we come up with a mixed signal characterization. What is this? Well, this is a mixed signal network lighter. It has two ports, analog ports, one for the RF, the other one for the clock, and you have a third port that is the digital port. So actually, our objective is to come up with a way to design a model to have something like a scattering parameter model that I can design, I can include in my design, and I can see these uh, uh, signals very, very easily. So, we actually build this uh, equipment using um, a national instruments box. So actually this is our main uh, um, box at, at the lab. As you can see, we are receiving the incident wave and reflected wave on one port. We are receiving the incident and reflected wave on the other port. And we are receiving the digital part on the other side. So we were able to collect different boards uh, on this package and actually to build a complete solution for this mixed signal approximation. So what can I do with this? Well, I have two approaches. <coughs> I have a signal integrity approach where actually I can look to my mixed signal component and I can consider that each element of my digital path is a different RF port. This is what I call signal integrity approach. This was something that was uh, presented by Professor Andrea Ferreiro some years ago. And actually in this case, you are interested to know if the square wave is square wave or not. But on the other side, I can have what is called a system behavioral model approach, which is my approach for modeling of these um, uh, ADCs and DAX components, where actually I have an analog port, 
and um, for the RF signal, another analog port for the plus signal, and then I convert the, the words, the bit words, I convert it back to an equivalent digital port. So it's like a digital port, it's like, sorry, an uh, incident and reflected wave port, but it is a representation in the digital domain. Well, with this in mind, we come up with a different model. We call it the D parameters, but they are exactly as the scattering parameters. Why we call it D parameters? Because the digital part is an equivalent signal and it's not an analog representation as the scattering parameters. So I can have my S11, I can have S21, I can have my S12, I can have um, the S22 if you want, which is zero in an ADC uh, because uh, I'm assuming that this is only a receiving device and the DAC is only a transmitting device. Well, but what can I do with it? Well, I can actually, in a software defined radio, as you see here, I can measure the RF DAC and ADC. By doing this, I can match it perfectly. I can equalize what is happening over the frequency. And actually, I can, uh, I will go a little bit faster on, on this slide, but I can model correctly the digital part and I can design my FPGA code so that the RF part is uh, actually continuous all over the place. Only as a very simple example, I will show you a digital pre-distortion application. What you see here is mainly a digital pre-distortion. You have your RF power amplifier path and then you take a sample and you insert the sample back to your FPGA. The problem is that when you reinsert back the signal, you have an ADC. And you assume, most of the people assume the ADC is linear and ideal. But what you see is actually the ADC is no linear. So when you actually feed back your signal, you see that the signal that exists before and after the ADC is different, mainly if the bandwidth is high. So if you have a high bandwidth, your ADC does not behave linearly. And so you have to de-embed this ADC. So what we did here was actually to extract a nonlinear model of the ADC using our uh, deep parameter approach. And by using that, we actually improve significantly the digital pre-distortion loop by correctly improving and correctly embedding the ADC modeling in our design. Well, I have another um, very simple approach. This circuit that you see here is actually a commercial product already from our, our um, uh, colleagues, which is a company called Altiflat. And in this case, what we did was mainly a one gigahertz repeater for CATV um, television. So we want to capture one gigahertz of analog RF signal equalize it over the band, transmit it using a software-defined radio package, and reconstruct it on the other side. So this is like a cloud radio test network for CATV approach. And what you can see is that if I don't have a precise characterization of all my ADCs and DACs, that will not be possible. And with our model, actually, the results were quite good, and we were able to send a 2048 QAM signal with four carrier square signal over uh, one gigahertz bandwidth, uh, pure digital um, RF signal. And this is actually something that we built using our uh, previous uh, scenario. So let me now move space and I talk to you about what can we do at the infrastructure layer. So how can we reduce significantly the base station energy consumption? Now I will show you a little bit what can we do on the sensor part? What can we do, as I tell you, how can we make the sensors extremely low cost, but at the same time, massive deployed and low power? And ideally, what I would love to have is actually to remove the batteries of the scenario. And even for the colleagues that normally say, okay, but in IoT, I have extremely low power sensors. I pick up two sensors on the market. So what you see here is a data sheet that exists on the market. One of the data sheets is a sub one gigahertz IoT uh, transceiver. The other one is a ultra low power Bluetooth transceiver. And you, what you can see is that they are extremely low power, of course they are, but when they need to transmit signals, 
they transmit 70 milliwatts and they receive 24 milliwatts. On the ultra low power Bluetooth, what you say is that when they need to transmit and receive, they need 9 milliwatts. So actually, what we are seeing here is that, okay, they are low power, and probably if they only transmit once per day, they, I'm okay with that. But what happens if I pick up commercial batteries on the market, and I put here the most well-known batteries on the market, and if, uh, if, if you look to the graph that is on the right part of my slide, what you see is that if you do a single transition per day with your sensors, that battery probably will live for 10, 20 years. But if you do 10 transitions per day, if you decide to put your EOIT sensor in a door, for instance, in a classroom where you open and close the door all the time, then the amount of time, or let's say the amount of the duration of the battery will reduce significantly. So this is actually the problem that is, can we remove the need of power for transmit and receive? Can we eliminate batteries at all? Can we get rid of them? And my approach for this is actually to look to the emerging technologies in the RF uh, world. One is, of course, energy harvesting. The other one is backscatter communications. And, of course, one very important piece of the puzzle will be wireless power transmission in that scenario. So let me briefly compare here energy harvesting and wireless power transmission. What I'm talking about here is mainly to collect electromagnetic energy out of the air and he takes that energy and transforms that energy in DC power, if you want. The problem with the energy harvesting is that you can collect energy from Wi-Fi, GSM, broadcast, cellular, and so on and so on. The problem is that the amount of energy that is available is extremely low, as you can see from the table above. And since the energy is extremely low, probably you can collect the energy a full day, and once per day you can have a humidity or a temperature um, sensor that sends back to your information. But that is, easy. is not enough for a real IoT sensor. On the other side, I have wireless power transmission. What that means, well, it is exactly the same as energy harvesting, if you want, but in this case, the transmitter is controlled by me. What that means, it means that the source of energy is wireless, but it's my source of energy. I'm not uh, using sources of energy that are publicly av available. And in this case, I can design my antennas to actually um, lay, uh, send energy for my sensor. And, <clears throat> of course, I can design these sensors very efficiently. I can play with, um, uh, let's say, with the RF to DC converter, which is nothing more than a diode-based circuit that will exchange RF signal to DC component. And I can play with the, 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 the signal waveform that I will send to the sensor so that I can increase the DC power that is being transmitted. You can say, okay, but the amount of, let's say, um, efficiency on the wireless power transmission is low. It is low yet. Uh, it is, continues to be low, but things are being done in order actually to increase this efficiency as much as, as we can. But what is more important actually than wireless power transmission is what is I call or what is called backscatter. So backscatter is what I call the battery paradigm. And this was actually one of the first backscatter <coughs> approaches is based on traditional radar, so you send an RF signal to, a, to, a, to an element and you have a reflected, uh, or part of that signal is reflected back. This is traditional radar uh, backscatter communication. And what I show in this slide it was actually one of the first backscatter artifacts that were put in a, a wooden uh, seal that was offered by the uh, Russians to the United States Embassy in the, in the nation, uh, United Nations. And what you can see actually is that in the back of this wooden seal, you have somehow a device that was there that was mainly uh, um, uh, uh, some kind of antenna that when you, it, uh, you illuminate that antenna with a large signal, if the antenna moves and what you have inside was mainly an audio uh, um, chamber, uh, reverberation chamber, that when you talk, 
the antenna characteristic changes. So if you measure the reflected waveform, you can actually create a passive microphone on the, on the room, and you can hear what is happening inside the room. So with this idea in mind, actually you can build a very simple backscatter radio. What that means, you have an antenna and you have a switch. If the switch is closed, your antenna is switched to the ground, so all the signal that you are going to receive is going to be reflected back. If your antenna, antenna is matched, what that means? It means that all the RF signal that you are going to receive is going to be spent or it's going to be uh, dissipated on the matched load and no uh, signal is going to reflect it back. So if I have a way to match and unmatch uh, my signal, it means that I can actually modulate my backscatter signal. So actually what we come up with an idea was why not combine this backscatter, which is actually technology of zero power transmission and receiving stage, why not combine this with a, a pure wireless signal so that I can receive this wireless signal and thus I can power up my sensor. So the a typical backscatter sensor is what you have there. You have an RF to DC converter, you have a power management, you have a microcontroller and then you activate your uh, wireless, uh, your, your uh, switch that actually will match or unmatch your antenna. So at the end, what you have here is a wireless power transmission combined with a backscatter approach. And uh, by playing with the codes, we can actually receive the signal back and we can actually make a zero power transmission scenario in that uh, sequence. So this is one of our designs where we actually use one frequency for wireless power transmission and we use another frequency for backscatter so that we can actually maintain a continuous flow of energy to our sensor and use the other frequency for the communication path. And here you can actually see what is happening. So the first uh, path uh, of this uh, prototype that I have here, you can see that both on the smith chart, the blue and the black um, dots are 1.8 gigahertz and 2.45 gigahertz. So I'm using 1.8 gigahertz for the wireless power transmission. So if you look to the 1.8 gigahertz, the 1.8 gigahertz is always connected, it's always matched. That means that I'm receiving power in my sensor. If you look to the 2.45 gigahertz, you see that my match goes from a matched load in this case to an unmatched load in this case. And so if I play with this matched and matched, I can actually create a binary phase shift keying or an amplitude shift keying back to my sensor. Well, with this in mind, we start to think, why not to use as more transistors? Why not to use different transistors? And instead of creating only two impedances, which was the traditional backscatter approach, why not to use different impedances? So the first approach that we did, we used uh, four transistors, and we create a quadrature phase shift keying scenario where actually we play with four different loads on our antenna, and then we start to play with different approaches. So our more recent prototype is what you're seeing on, on the image. We have a 16 QAM uh, using two transistors, and uh, much more recent, we combine wireless power transmission with multi-level backscatter, and actually we build uh, 16 QAM scenario, and the maximum we achieved with this was around one gigabit per second using only backscattered communication, and the sensor can be powered with wireless power transmission. So what was our main goal was actually to remove completely the battery out of our sensor, but we achieve also one gigabit or near one gigabit per second scenario. What that means, it means that we can ideally transmit video if you want on this, on this um, uh, scheme. So we have been continuing to work with this. So this is an automatic tool that we developed with National Instruments POP that I showed you before. And actually, we can play and decide if we want to go from a 16 QAM to a 64 QAM backscatter radio by uh, playing with that and by characterizing completely my sensor. So what is our main goal? for a completely passive, passive in the sense of energy transmission, IoT network, well, it's 
mainly to create a cloud radio access network access point that is going to communicate with our sensors. To have our sensors deployed on the field using um, multi-level backscatter communication and to have specific wireless power transmission to power up our sensors in a very efficient and uh, uh, dedicated mode in this scenario. So sorry for being delayed, but this concludes my talk. I uh, leave here a list of a lot of people that contribute to all this work and uh, you are going to have access to the slides, but uh, you have a, a large uh, group of bibliography papers uh, that we have published in, in the last the years. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you, Nuno. Uh, really interesting stuff here. Uh, okay, so now it's time for our question and answer session. Uh, but before we start, please remember that you can still submit questions through the Q and A panel. Uh, and we just have a few questions at this point, so please feel free to uh, to submit any questions that you that you might have. Uh, at this time. Uh, let's see. So one question that we have here is, could you make any comments about how uh, the IoT and 5G are connected or not connected or uh, any overlap, et cetera? Yes, uh, so uh, as I read, the first question is, what is the relationship between IoT and 5G? Well, I will say that uh, IoT uh, will be a part of 5G. So 5G, uh, if you can look to the 5G approach all over the world, it's mainly focusing on, on three different things, let's say. One thing is actually very high bit rate. What that means, it means that we can have gigabit per second if I want in a way that actually on this gigabit per second, I can have it all over the place without even think about it. On the other part is the IoT concept. The IoT in the sense that I want to have massive deployment. I want to have sensors all over the place. IoT is already here. We already have IoT sensors being deployed on the market, but it's not yet massive. Massive, massive. I was saying that all our pieces of cloth will have an IoT tech. And on the other side, uh, the third part of the 5G is actually on the latency. We need to have very, very good latency if we want to guarantee that we can do um, video games on the fly and so on and so on. So 5G, if I have to select three big pieces of 5G, this will be the, the three big pieces of uh, 5G. So some, uh, somehow I, I hope I answered your question. I believe that's, uh, that's just fine. Uh, let's see. Here's another question. Uh, is the backscatter approach similar to long-range RFID? Well, yes, I will say that uh, RFID use backscatter. Even uh, the long-range or the short-range, both of them, they, they all of them, let's say, use backscatter. If they, most of them are passive, or even if you go to the SME passive, they use backscatter communication. What is the difference of what I showed today is that most of the backscatter devices that you have on the RFID scenario is either binary phase shifting or amplitude shifting. In our scenario, what we are doing at the moment is actually to go for a multi-level backscatter, that is to use, uh, how can I say this, to use um, more levels of my uh, backscatter so that I can in increase the bit rate with the same bandwidth, that is, I want to use quadrature phase shifting, quadrature amplitude modulation, and so on, using the same uh, approach as the traditional um, RFID backscatter. I got you. Okay. All right, on to the next question. So, uh, let's see. Will power harvesting not reduce multipath richness, richness in, in wireless communication? That's a good question. <laughs> so, uh, will power harvesting not reduce multipath richness in wireless communication? 
Well, I don't think so because um, let's see. If you look mainly about power harvesting, um, in the sense that we are collecting electromagnetic energy from the common sources, from the available sources, um, the multipad will be there as it is for wireless communication. If you are talking about uh, energy harvesting from a perspective of wireless power transmission, where I'm going to design highly um, beacon um, signals for my, for my device, um, that depends on the approach I'm going to follow because what happens there is that if you are inside an environment, probably multipath will be useful for wireless power transmission. If you are in a wider region, if you are outside, then multipath will not be as good as, as I want for wireless power transmission. So this will be a case to case study always. Um, on to the next one. Is it feasible to make a wireless renewable power network that covers a wider region? Well, it depends, again. <laughs> it depends on what you uh, talk about wireless um, power transmission. Let, let me say it like this. Using the backscatter approach that I showed you before, uh, where we are going to have wireless power transmitters combined with backscatter. The approach is actually to distribute wireless power sources. So uh, have a, a fixed, uh, let's say, uh, communication base station, but this base station will be mainly a receiving base station. And then have a distributed wireless power um, transmitters all over the wider region where you want to put it. So in that sense, I think it's going to be viable to implement such, a, 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 let's say, a, a IoT scenario. If we are talking on the, on the scenario where you have a base station that covers 20 or 30 kilometers using wireless power transmission, I don't believe on that. I don't believe on that because the amount of energy that you have to send to the air was huge. Uh, if you do it is on Mars or probably on Jupiter, no problem. If you do it on Earth, you have the problem of having humans in the middle. So I, I, I don't I don't like very much this approach. But for instance, if you do it inside a house where the distance is probably 10 meters from your uh, transmitter to your sensor, probably the amount of energy that is um, related with that is so small that you can do it and you can actually implement this this, this type of solution. So something on the on the scale of a, a house or maybe a small apartment complex, something like that. Yeah, something like that, exactly. Okay. We have a couple of questions on this next topic, and uh, so I'll just kind of combine those together. And it, it, one of them is, what are the major challenges facing IoT? And the other is, where do you think the key research areas are going to be in order to accommodate IoT over cellular networks? So perhaps you can lump those together and. Let us know what your perspective is on the, the major challenges and the research areas that are out there for these areas. Well, yeah, uh, from my point of view, the major challenge for IoT, is, as you saw, is actually to reduce as much as we can the amount of power I need for the transmitter-receiver scenario. So this is the major challenge. My perspective for this, from an RF perspective, point of view is actually that I believe this sensor should go for a backscatter approach. Uh, why? Because it's the lowest power I can have in, in this scenario. So this is my approach. But again, this depends on the application of the UF. Because the backscatter scenario can can be good for let's say dozens or, or even one one uh, um, hundred of meters, but after that uh, you cannot use the backscatter approach. So for this type of applications, I believe this is where we should go. The other thing is actually on the high bit rate approach. On the high bit rate approach, what is our problem? Well, our problem, as I said, is on the way we think uh, cellular communications. We think cellular communications in a way that we have base stations that are probably six or five kilometers away from me 
And each time I have to make a phone call, I have to connect to that base station. And if you look carefully to the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years, Wi-Fi showed that that was not the option, the most viable option to, to use. And if you have an access point Wi-Fi that costs probably $20, you can put your Wi-Fi access point inside your house, inside the restaurant, inside the bar, and you have immediately high bit rate. And the amount of energy the Wi-Fi access point is paying is not comparable with the base station. So this is where I think cloud radio access network can make a, a difference because it can probably distribute the wireless access like the Wi-Fi did without, let's say, anything planned when, when they, they start to deploy it. Okay, I think that clarifies it. Thank you. Okay, so let's go with this last question here. There are a couple of questions, uh, again, that are kind of asking similar questions. So um, could you make some comments about the, the frequency frequencies that are used for this, the frequency bands? Do you use the same frequency for transmit and receive in the backscatter setup? Uh, any comments along those lines uh, to clarify that would be useful. Well, uh, it depends, on, again, on, on the standard and the protocol you are going to implement. If, if you do uh, time division duplex, well, you, can do, you can use the same frequency for the transmit and receive. If you want to do other type of, of transmission and receive pets, probably we need to use different uh, frequencies. Um, at the moment, we are using the same frequency, and we multiplex the, 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 the information on, on, in the time domain. So there is no problem with that. Uh, let me follow that up with one question. What if there are multiple yeah. devices that you need to communicate with? Have you thought, of, are there ways to handle that with a backscatter? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 well, again, um, then we, we, we really need to implement a, a different protocol stack, right? I didn't talk about that, but uh, I did not talk about Mac layer approach. But if you go uh, for a multi-scheme, uh, we we can we can implement it with a Mac approach without any any issue. Of course, uh, there will be a limit uh, on the simultaneous transmission and receive of these sensors. Uh, but uh, the 14 uh, approaches for IoT, um, again, uh, as I said, inside a house or a condominium. Uh, the fourth in approach is not the IoT sensor will not be transmitting continuously. It will be con transmitting dozens of times during the day. So by using that, probably I can design uh, uh, an optimized Mac layers that actually can uh, reduce the, the amount of, of uh, let's say, interference between these sensors. And we, at the moment, we have several sensors already working like this. Um, but uh, I'm an RF guy, so I did not go for the Mac layer approach, but I believe we, it's not very difficult to design this Mac layer approach for this scenario. I, I, I agree. It seems reasonable that, it's, uh, that there is a solution there. It just needs to be done. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this presentation. Uh, we do still have a few questions in the queue. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't have time to answer those, but the uh, the presenter will follow up with those uh, offline. Um, as we said earlier, uh, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org, and all the registrants will get an email reminder with that address when it's available. For attendees who would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that is provided on the last slide of this presentation, which is shown right now. Uh, also, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Carvalho for an excellent and informative presentation. We really appreciate you uh, giving this presentation to us today. Special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.